And so I felt like that was a real answer to prayer because I would say it was about three weeks ago the Lord laid on my heart a, a lesson, a series of lessons uh, that was pretty specifically tied to <laughs> men in their study. Very seldom does he do that without giving me an opportunity to share it. And when Michelle called Sunday afternoon and said, we need a teacher for the men's Bible study, I said, okay, now I understand why the Lord worked that way. So uh, we're going to be looking basically at a multi-week study on being led along on David's 30 mighty men. All right? In First Chronicles, uh, the 11th chapter, uh, you'll find um, the, the story of how David was able to create um, a nation, create a, a new country. Uh, Saul had been the first king, but they really hadn't started to build a nation until David started to put things together. And he had to have helpers. Uh, it's First Chronicles 11. Good evening, good evening. And that's the basis for the whole next series of lessons. All right? Um, we're going to be trying to emulate or trying to understand the lessons of why David chose these 30 mighty men and how we might be able to get some lessons for our own lives, our own ministry, from that, that lesson that he taught. Now, that gives you a, sort of an overview. We're going to be talking about David's mighty men. And there's been a lot of different um, men's programs and a lot of different kinds of ways that men have been encouraged to share, challenged. Um, one of the first things I think I ever remember was uh, uh, what they used to call a lay witness mission. And that started out as a men's ministry. And they would these men would go to different churches and give their testimonies. And they would share back and forth. It became uh, a lot more mixed than that. But uh, that was originally a lay witness ministry. Um, we've had the Gideons. We've had all kinds of men's ministry. Promise Keepers was one of the most famous ones. And so we continue to... Um, try and challenge. The reason we challenge men in a specific way, and, and this is my experience, when men are able to capture a picture in their mind, in their heart, of what God can do through us as men, amazing things happen in the church. Okay? Mm -hmm. And there's real value to having a men's group that knows, first of all, how to pray, how to walk with the Lord, how to lead, how to be good stewards of their lives. And that is an exciting thing. And I could give you just a, a, a real brief explanation in my own way of research. Scientists tell us that when one person in a group of friends goes on a diet and loses weight, without even saying anything, others in that group will say, hey, I could, maybe I can uh, lose a little weight and maybe I could uh, put myself in a little healthier situation. And then they will pick that up. When, <laughs> that was not pointed at anybody. All right. If, if, if a person in a circle, I came into the right circle. You do for me. I don't. I don't yet, but I'm working. All right. But when we have something bad that happens, okay, let's say somebody gets divorced the same thing happens within that circle. And other families will begin to get into difficulty and you can actually see the families begin to weaken. All right? I can't explain it in the sense of saying, okay, here's the way the process works. But I watched a pastor friend of mine. Um, he got himself into trouble with an immoral relationship 
And as a result, six individual families from that church were also destroyed. Not because he had had a relationship with any of those people, but just his influence rippled out. Okay? So what we're saying here is if, if we want to see ripples of good and ripples of salvation and ripples of grace, we increase our own passion for ministry. We focus on what are the most important issues in our lives. And lo and behold, it's going to have an impact as it ripples out. Uh, the men's group was the key to that. And I said, here's what you need, boys. Here's what you got to have. Everything you do has to strengthen you individually in one of four different ways. Either you're increasing your knowledge of God's Word and how to properly divide it. Either you're deepening your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You are getting a better understanding and a handle on who you are and where you came from and how you fit into the world as a Christian man, as a part of this congregation. Or you are expanding. My feeling is every person ought to have a ministry in the church. You want to have a growing, dynamic impact on your community. And Amen. so everything that we did for the next three years was to take each lesson, each sermon, each time we got to, we turned what uh, Sunday nights into a, almost like a, a Bible study college. We ran courses, gave graduation uh, uh, certificates and everything, ran the whole program. And that church went from being fairly stagnant and, I mean, they're always a good church, I mean, they're good people, nice community, but they want to be on fire. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so this lesson and these series are designed to help the fellowship church catch fire, ripple out good, bring a sense of excitement, uh, possibilities, not only to the church, but outside of that and through this whole community. There's the issue. There's a a word that I've learned here recently, and it's called missional. Mm -hmm. I heard it. All right. <clears throat> I was at a, a their pastor is starting the uh, real life church in the old Meadowland building. And last Sunday night we were over there uh, listening to uh, Jerry, Patrick Jerry, uh, give us his instruction, and he talked about being missional. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, missional. Missional. Mm -hmm. missional. I've heard that. And I said, well, that's interesting. I've not used that word a whole mm -hmm. lot. But what it really means is driven by the sense of mission that God gave us as our Lord and Savior. The mission. Mm -hmm. So we become a missional church. When I was in business, we talked about things that were mission critical. Uh, that was uh, a, a way of expressing the fact that we were going to watch and judge everything that happened by whether or not it took us from where we are right now to being better prepared to accomplish our mission as a business. And if it wasn't mission critical, it got tossed to the side because we had to stay focused on being mission critical. Just the things that move the business forward. And there were all kinds of things that were good things to do. The outside of the building looked terrible. It needed a paint job. But you know, it didn't move that business forward to spend the resources to paint that building. So it was put aside until something more critical, mission critical, was given. I think we need to realize that as a body, as a church, Jesus Christ gave us a task to do. Uh, Pastor Jerry, I was so wise. Uh, we were talking with him afterwards, and he said, well, I, you know, being a new pastor, just starting this congregation, just trying to get things together, there's a lot of things I could do, with bulletins and sweeping and opening the church and turning the thermostats and up and all the other kinds of things that someone with no staff, no church congregation, has to do. 
And he said, I absolutely refuse because my job is to reach people for Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, not set the make things up. And he started telling about how he had to use his judgment to balance everything, that, that the urgency of some of those things that would move the ministry forward. The job is to reach those that are out there. Okay? He's mission critical. He's sorting everything out to see if it meets the mission statement and trying to get the job done. All right? I think we need to realize, as a congregation of people, just normal, everyday people that have, have come to the point where God's used us to do so many good things, we need to just stop once in a while, take a big long breath and say, am I still focused on being missional? Am I focused on what's mission critical? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about what we're supposed to do, I'm going to use one thought and one theme. And so this is sort of a definition mm -hmm. setting time. I want us to go backwards and say everything that comes along in our discussion, everything that happens in our conversation, everything that happens in our planning sessions, everything that happens in our, you know, fellowship times, is it lifting up the body of Christ? Is it lifting up the mission that we have? Is it helping to push the thing farther along the way? And I don't believe we can do I don't believe we can actually come to the point where we can say that in the positive, in the affirmative, if we haven't thoughtfully and prayerfully considered, are we really listening to God's voice? Are we letting Him lead us? Because a lot of times what we're doing, and it's as normal as anything that can happen, I do it too. Well, I used to do it this way. I feel real good about doing it this way. This is one of the things that makes me feel wonderful. 